Howdy, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. Love, love, love this company. You'll be hearing all about them later from me later in the episode. But now, on with the show. It's really easy to say that I think equities are going to go down another 20, 30 percent. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I really think that the market is underestimating what it takes to slow down 8 percent inflation. How far more does the Fed have to go? And in my view, they have to go farther. And so there is a lot more pain to come. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I am joined by Joseph Wang, a.k.a. Fed Guy, as you might know him on Twitter. Joseph, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. Thrilled to be here. All right, we've got a lot of really informa- uh, interesting information to cover here, uh, and we're going to be diving into everyone's favorite topic, which is QT, also known as quantitative tightening. Uh, I don't think with something like QT, you can actually start at too high of a level. Uh, I'm sure folks will be very familiar with it at this point. It's kind of all the rage, uh, kind of the biggest number one buzzword. But uh, Joseph, can you just start from like a 10,000 foot view? When we talk about quantitative tightening, what are we talking about here? And since it technically began, I guess, two days ago, we're recording this on the third. Uh, walk us through kind of the timeline of when this starts to take place as well. Yeah, sure. So, you know, QT is, was one of the biggest things I worked on when I was at the Fed. So I basically looked through uh, it at all doors, all different kinds of angles. At, at a very high level, you can think of QT as a reverse QE. Now, what did QE do? QE at a high level took out treasury securities and replaced them with uh, liquidity. If you're a bank, that means reserves, which is cash held at the Fed. If you're not a bank, that means bank deposits. That means deposits held at a commercial bank. At a high level, QE reverses this, but not necessarily so. The thing about QT is there are a lot of different moving parts. Now, broadly speaking, I think of QT in two ways. One is that it adds duration into the market, which is to say it increases the supply of treasury securities that the private sector has held. And the second part is that it withdraws liquidity out of the financial system. And that part is actually less clear because there are different ways that QT can occur where it's less of a drain on the financial system. But I'll talk about the first part first. Well, so what happens mechanically at QT? So the Fed bought a whole bunch of treasury securities, right? Let's say the Fed bought a security and it matures. What happens during QT? Well, what happens during QT is that the US Treasury, it'll issue new debt and use the proceeds of that debt to repay the Fed. The Fed then takes that money and cancels it. It disappears out of thin air. So. At the end of the day, someone somewhere in the world is holding a treasury security that was used to refinance the Fed. So the total supply of treasury securities in the, in the market increases. Now, you can think of this as putting upward pressure on interest rates. At a high level, interest rates are really supply and demand. This is even more so between the 10 and, let's say, the longer dated treasury securities between 10 and 30 years. So, you know, if you, if you add increase the supply of something, the price of something declines. And so that usually means, okay, so for interest rates, that for fixed income, that means higher yields. Um, you know, if you think about the purpose of QE, which was to push interest rates lower, it makes perfect sense that for QT interest rates, all things equal would be higher, right? So one, you no, know, private sector has to uh, absorb more. Now it's the second part of QT that's a little bit less clear. Mm-hmm. So. The way that liquidity is drained from the financial system, though, really depends upon who ends up buying those new securities. Now, there are ways that QT can go, which will be absolutely painless. And I think that's what the Fed is praying for. So if you look about, if you hear us to what uh, Fed officials talk about when they talk about QT, they're like, you know, QT, QT is going to be really painless. Why? Because there's tremendous amounts of money, about $2 trillion in the reverse repo facility. So the Fed thinks that when it does QT, you know, money will come out of the reverse refill facility and simply, you know, a purchase be used to purchase those new securities. And if that happens, it it will be very painless. Um, But there are other ways this can go as well. For example, let's say the people who buy these new issued treasury securities fund them using deposits they hold at a commercial bank. For example, let's say I have a hundred million dollars in JPM. I buy a new treasury security, I withdraw money from my bank account, and I use it to buy the treasury security. When you do QT in that fashion, what happens is that there's less, there's less money into the financial system. So mm. on the one hand, you can think about, you know, so $100 million left the banking system, went to the Fed, and got canceled. So it drains liquidity in the financial system, which is 
you know, which is good and bad. It's good if you want to stop inflation. It's bad, though, if, if you're in a context like we are today. So what's happening today? Bonds are being sold off. Stocks are selling off. Another way to look at it is everyone wants to hold cash. No one yeah. wants to hold bonds. No one wants to hold stocks. Uh, this is really different from um, other re market regimes. Usually, let's say the stock market goes down and everyone wants to hold bonds. There's kind of a hedge there. So bonds are kind of a safe haven, but there is no safe haven now. The only safe haven is cash and everyone wants to have cash. But at the same time, there's a possibility that with QE, QT proceeding, there could be less cash in the system. You know, at a high level, that means if you want cash, you know, you're going to have to compete for a smaller pool of it. That means you have to lower uh, what you're willing to accept for your assets that you sell. Maybe I have an Apple. Okay, well, maybe I have to, like a $100 stock. Instead of selling it at $100, maybe I have to sell it at $99 to get the cash that I want. Um, you know, if you step back, if you think about this, like in, in 2008, for example, or any other market crash crisis, what the authorities usually do is they add cash into the system. And the authorities here understand market crashes are really all about people wanting to hold more cash. So they put cash in the system. That was what happened in 2008, and that makes things a little bit better. Uh, now you're kind of doing the opposite. You're raising rates, you're telling everyone that we've got to tighten financial conditions, and you're closing the exits, so to speak. You're taking cash out of the system. So that's just one way the QT can proceed. Um, it's always possible that things play out the way that the Fed officials think they will proceed, well, hope they will proceed, by, by money coming out of the reverse repo facility and you know, funding QT. So you know, beforehand, it's really hard to know actually how QT will proceed uh, on the liquidity side, how, where it will drain the money. Um, the easiest way for me, at least, to see what will happen is to really to just see what's been happening recently. Now, the financial system, it's, it's always changing and it's opaque. You know, it's like markets, they're different regimes. If you just look at what happened recently, it's, it's the Treasury raising money to top up its Treasury general account, which is its checking account at the Fed. So the Treasury issued a whole lot of debt and raised its uh, TGA account balance by about $600 billion in the first quarter of this year. Hmm. That is very, that's equivalent to, to QT from a functional perspective. Again, you're issuing debt, taking money out of the financial system. The difference being that when the Fed does it, it just cancels that money. But when the Treasury is building up the TGA, that money just sits idle in the TGA. Uh, Joseph, well, can, can I actually yeah. pause you just for two seconds? Just yes, you, oh, so you, you, always, you, always pause it okay. because I, uh, I want to be able to, to address any questions you have. We've, we've gone through so much information here. I just want to make sure I understand everything right. And then I've got a couple of follow-up questions for you about almost like what a soft versus hard landing on QT could look like. So I agree. I, I read your latest piece and it seems like there's a good way this could happen and maybe a less orderly way that this could translate into markets. So... Let me see if I can kind of repeat back to you what you just told me, right? Basically, the process of quantitative easing, right? This is what we're unwinding here. We're doing the opposite and we're going to be quantitative tightening. So a quantitative easing is, is basically an asset swap, right? And they're taking treasuries that exist out there that get issued by the U.S. Treasury. They're moving it into the Fed in exchange for reserves, right? And kind of bank deposits. And that's this liquidity. And that has the effect of kind of pushing down interest rates because what the Fed is actually doing is they're going out to the open market. They're buying right? These fixed income securities, right? There's actually treasuries and there's mortgage backed securities, which is what I want to get into uh, as well. Um, and that's actually, that's, you know, increasing the price, which decreases the yield. Now that entire process is, is kind of working in reverse, right? So they're not, the Fed isn't actually going out and, and selling these, uh, these fixed income securities, but they're going to let them expire. And basically instead of, so that structural bid that's existed right for these for these uh fixed income securities is going away which means the price go down goes down and the yield goes up that's about right so far right so that's increased that's tightening financial conditions right that's why you're starting to see yields creep back up that's why you're starting to see uh mortgage rates uh kind of creep back up uh in general but basically uh you know one of the other you know uh mechanics that you get into in your post right is what uh this, all this liquidity that they've created is doing. So right now, a lot of that liquidity is parked in the reverse repo facility because it's seeking higher yields than the artificially low yields that have been created by quantitative easing. I think what you're saying is what the Fed is hoping is that when quantitative tightening starts, 
when they're increasing uh, the tightness of monetary conditions, financial conditions, those yields also start to become more attractive. So that $2 trillion that's sitting in the reverse repo facility could actually just find its way kind of into you know, into buying these the treasury securities. And that would be very, that would be like the best way that QT could happen. Is so, that right? So you can think of money in the RRP as kind of just the money that the system is in need. There's nowhere right. place to put it. Like you mentioned, it's like excess. So it just sits there. Got it. So when you drain something that's excess, you know, that that's no one, no one, you know, no one is deprived of liquidity. So it's, it's very neutral. The way that would happen is if you have someone who steps up like a hedge fund borrowing from a money market fund to purchase treasuries. So the the money in the RRP, it's held by a very specific type of investor. They're money market funds, and mm-hmm. they're highly, highly regulated. They can only invest in a very narrow set of assets, only the super safe assets. So they can go and they can buy treasury bills, which are short data treasuries, or more likely they will lend in the repo market. Uh, a repo is just a secured loan against treasury securities. When you lend in the repo market, you get treasuries as a collateral. So, you know, it's super safe. That's why the money funds are allowed to invest in repo. Now, if the money funds with, were to withdraw money out of the reverse repo facility and then lend to a hedge fund who then takes that money to buy the newly issued treasuries, you'd have a beautiful, smooth, neutral, quantitative tightening. Mm. But it all depends on the hedge funds coming in and having demand to borrow in the repo market. And that's just not happening. So I, I think some context is helpful to understand why. So the treasury market, like only mar- all markets, is dynamic and it's always changing. The marginal buyer of treasury securities to the tune of hundreds of billions pre-2020 was the hedge fund community. So they were buying treasuries and funding those purchases by borrowing in the repo market. So they were doing that as part of a trade where they would sell futures and hold the cash and try to harvest, basically harvest the inefficiencies between the futures market and the cash market. It's called a cash futures basis trade. Mm-hmm. That, that's a way to, for hedge funds to earn. It's basically collecting pennies in front of a steamroller. Right. The amount you hold is, the amount you earn is very small, but you take a whole bunch of leverage. So fast forward to March 2020, everyone in that trade basically got blown Steam. up. Yeah, uh, steamroller caught up. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> so to speak. If you, if, <laughs> they, yeah, they totally got flat. There are so many Bloomberg stories around then where you have these entire hedge funds who basically just you know just got you know broke basically. Mm. So people usually what happens if if you're in a trade and you get blown up is you don't come back for a while. Um, if you think about the Great Financial Crisis, a lot of that was centered in. Um, private label mortgage securities. And that industry has gone away and you know hasn't come back, even though we're like more than 10 years since. The cash futures basis trade will come back one day, but so far it doesn't look like it's it's back yet. So um, that that's like basically the only way you could have a, a very calm QT. If these hedge funds come back and they were, they're willing to borrow, uh, uh, buy the newly issued treasuries by funding from money held in the RRP, but that's, that, that, that's just not happening yeah. so far at least. So basically, uh, you know, to again, maybe try to sum up what you're saying here, the, the most orderly form of QT is there's this, um, yeah, almost excess amount of liquidity cash that needs a home that could drain from the RRP. Uh, and that would be like the most orderly way that this could happen. Walk me through what a less orderly landing for a quantitative ease or a quantitative tightening could look like. Like where would that uh, money kind of come from? Yeah. So at a high level, you can think about, so what you think about as money really depends on who you are in the financial system. If you're mm-hmm. a bank, it's deposits at the Fed. If, if you and me, it's deposits at a commercial bank, right? So what's in my checking account? Now, when you take money out of the RRP to fund QT, the total amount of bank deposits in the financial system doesn't change at all. So it, it doesn't really drain uh, money, what we, most of us consider to be money. Um, but a less orderly QT would happen a less orderly QT would be draining what we think of as money, bank deposits, Mm -hmm. and and also what uh, banks think of as money, which are bank reserves. So that happens if instead of, so the the newly issued treasuries that are meant to repay the Fed, that's not purchased by hedge funds using money from the RRP, that's purchased by people or investors using money held in a bank. What that does then is that it takes away money that was in the banking system, right? So someone somewhere, the, the amount, total amount of money, M2, money supply, so to speak, declines mm. when you do that. 
Now, usually that's not a big deal. I mean, you know, make it, the banking system creates money as it creates loans. What's interesting is that the pace of what this is proceeding, you have QT, which is going to proceed at an extremely rapid rate. So the Fed is saying a 95 billion maximum a month when it's in full steam. When it did QT last time, the maximum it ever gone, went to was 50 billion. So that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And the other thing is that the you're going to have another drain, another drain that's happening at the same time as QT, and that's the RRP is continues to grow, and it's going to grow even more. When the RRP grows, you're also taking money out of the banking system. So bigger context, we're in a place where everyone wants cash, but the supply of cash is declining, and that's from QT, and that's from the increase in the RRP. And I think these two uh, have the potential to be disruptive to, to the markets because, well, I mean, listen, if you take away cash when everyone wants cash, then uh, asset prices are going to have to go lower as people sell, as people who really want cash are forced to sell at lower prices to compete for, you know, a smaller pool of cash. Right. I kind of think about this when the dollar rallies, right? That's bad for especially risk assets around the world, but basically, basically everything. Um, so like walk me through what happens when the the, the kind of premium on the on cash goes up. And also like, how would you almost measure this, right? We're getting into very esoteric kind of concepts here. Like what is money? <laughs> what is this type of money to this type of person? Like, where does this translate? Like how, do, how does this kind of show up in the financial system? Like where could we track this? I'd look at just look at asset prices. I mean, if mm -hmm. you have asset prices that are just declining and declining, what that tells you is that people don't want to hold assets. They want to hold cash. I think what's more interesting probably is is the um, is the issuance side of treasury. So you have this going you have this going on where you're you're draining cash out of the system, both from QT and both from the RRP, which could be quite significant. But you're also increasing uh, the supply of treasuries, and I think that's probably going to be the the biggest weak point for QT going forward. Um, the 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 way to think about this is is to think about well. What's the supply and what's the demand for tr for treasury securities? And the supply the supply looks to be you know very heavy in longer dated treasuries. Now the the agency who decides what kind of treasuries to issue it's that's the Office of Debt Management mm -hmm. as part of the U.S. Treasury. Now they have lots of levers to pull. They can decide to issue very short dated treasuries, which are called treasury bills, and that's very neutral to the financial system. But instead, they've decided to actually reduce that issuance and issue more longer dated treasuries. So going forward, what's going to happen is partly because of the deficit, but partly because of QT, the, the non-Fed sector is going to have to absorb about $1.5 trillion in treasuries each year for the next few years. Historically, that, that's very high. So that's the supply side of the treasury market. Now, there's, here's the demand side. Now, Pre-2020, the marginal person that bought it was a hedge fund, as we, we talked about. Post-2020, the marginal buyer was a uh, Fed, of course, and of the commercial banks. And those guys are all, those guys are all out now. So you're, you're walking into a situation that's actually very similar to the repo crisis in September 2019. Mm. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, in 20, September of 2019, the repo rates basically exploded higher. Now, usually repo is a very sleepy market. Um, at that time, it, repo was trading about two and a quarter percent. Um, repo is sleepy, so maybe every day it'd go up, maybe 2.26, maybe 2.20. It fluctuates around there. But in one day in September, it went to as high as 10%. So it literally mm. just exploded higher and broke. And a lot of that has to do with the mechanics that were happening behind the scenes in quantitative tightening. So, and, okay, so I guess I'll give a little bit of background about what was going on there. So heading into September 2019, September 2019 uh, there was tremendous demand in repo financing. Like, it, again, it's the hedge funds wanting to borrow in the treasury market, wanting to borrow in the repo market to buy treasuries. You have that going on, pushing repo rates higher and higher. At the same time, at the time, the commercial banks, they were the marginal lenders of the repo market, okay? So you have increasing demand and you have a supply of cash in the market that's kind of shifting to the left. It's shifting to the left because of quantitative tightening, which is the Fed draining money out of the banking system. So 
when you have increasing demand and shrinking supply, eventually something breaks and you have rates that go, whew, you know, to, to the moon, basically. And the same thing is playing out today, actually. So again, like I just mentioned, the U.S. Treasury is going to issue about, you know, $1.5 trillion, including QT stuff that the non-bank sector, the non-Fed sector has to absorb, increasing demand for financing. At the same time, the people who are buying treasuries before walking away, in part because the Fed is taking away cash out of the banking system. Banks last time used their QE cash to invest in repo because repo rates were very high, higher than they could get by leaving the money on deposit at the Fed. This time, repo rates are very low, so it did not make sense for them to leave their money, uh, invest, in repo, invest in repo. So they instead they invested in treasury securities, which earned a higher rate than leaving money on deposit at the Fed. So the exact same dynamic, increasing demand for financing by the US government, reducing supply of financing from the people who are, who are uh, investing in treasury securities, you can easily have another accident happen, just like you did in 2019, where rates shoot up significantly. Now, another way to think about this is that markets who benefited from QE get hurt by QT. Last time around, markets have benefited from QE, repo market. This time around, markets have benefited from QE, treasury market. And markets get hurt from QT, you know, likely the same. And, you know, it, it's... Uh, that, that's kind of what how I think about this. Um, there's, there's a lot of other aspects to this that, that suggest weakness to it. But uh, I guess I'll stop here um, if you have any you know, follow-up yeah. questions and stuff. I forget who described this. Uh, this, this was a, um, almost like a little bit of a light bulb for me. When, you know, because I used to think of like assets as assets. You move into assets and uh, like in and out of assets and into cash as, as like a separate thing. But then someone described, uh, you know, when stocks are going down, it's, it's actually a bubble in cash. And that was, I thought that was a pretty, uh, I thought that was a great way to describe it, um, honestly, because uh, it is, everything is just relative to one another. Everything's an asset and it's all just relative to one another. Um, but I, I do like this idea. I mean, and it's it's very simple, right? And very elegant that whatever assets benefited from QE should, uh, they should be proportionally um, hurt by QT. And one of the asset classes that got benefited, right? It's just kind of, we generally call it like long duration assets, risk assets, whatever you want to call it. Um, but like, let's say, let's say risk assets. So, so like tech stocks, right? Because QE kind of has this um, kind of actually explicit consequence, right? I think Ben Bernanke explicitly said one of the, uh, you know, the intended actions of quantitative easing was to push investors kind of out along the risk curve, right? So we've seen kind of these risky tech stocks, uh, you know, certainly since uh, 2008, kind of be on a one way track, which is up. Um, and now at the announcement of QT, uh, they've really taken an enormous hammering, right? Uh, I mean, some of the riskier stuff like the Pelotons of the world, the Zooms of the world, and you think these things are down 95, uh, you know, 80, like 80, anywhere between 80 and 95% in some cases. Um, my, my question to you is how much of that pain has already happened and how much is still in the future, right? Markets are forward looking. Uh, so basically how much of the, the expected pain of QE is already uh, kind of built into asset prices and how much is still to come right when we're just starting to enact uh, QT. I think that's the right way to think about this, uh, what's in the price, right? So right. Uh, in, in practice, I think it's actually a hard framework to operate because, you know, if you think about, let's say, Donald Trump not too long ago, trade trade deals are going well, you know, the market goes up, okay, market get, next day, trade deals are going well, trade talks are going well, okay, market goes up. So the same thing can get repriced over and over again. Mm. So. <laughs> That's one thing. To, one thing to keep in mind. Um, I actually think that it's not that. I think the market is actually um, misunderstanding some of the things that that the Fed is saying. So there's a general hawkish stance that the Fed has started even before QT, and that's through interest rates. Right? It's been raising interest rates. So when the Fed raises interest rates, it, it really, it's mostly about what it's saying. So when it says that it's going to raise interest rates, that gets immediately priced into the market. So the Fed doesn't actually have to go and, you know, go up 50 basis points. It says it's going to do it. It's in the markets. And I think that actually has a bigger impact in hurting the tech stocks and, and the equity markets more than, than QT so far, because I think it's very difficult to price in QT and most people don't really understand how it works. That what happens when you raise interest rates? Well, you know, you're kind of making everyone take haircuts on their treasury, your fixed income portfolios, 
and that forces some people to sell equities to rebalance. Like a lot of people manage their money with a balanced e stock equity portfolio. So I view what's happened so far, a big part of it as simply just higher interest rates, imposing losses on the bond part of someone's portfolio, forcing them to sell some of the stocks to rebalance. So let, let's say you have a 50-50 portfolio, half in bonds, half in stocks. Okay, let's say you lose $2 because of Fed rate hikes in your bond portfolio. Now you have $98. In order to get back to your 50-50 allocation, you sell $1 in equities to buy $1 in bonds, right? So when you when the Fed hikes rates, they're forcing fixed income to take losses. Mechanically, that also forces equity markets to take losses. I think that's a big part of what happened. Not QT, but rate rises. So the question is, how far more does the Fed have to go and in my view, they have to go farther. And so there's a lot more pain to come. I think markets are going to be very surprised by how much more pain there is to come. And, and the way to think about this, I think, is to understand how the Fed thinks about the world. The Fed thinks about the world through the lens of the neutral rate. Now, what is the neutral rate? The neutral rate, okay, those, this is, in my view, probably the, not a really useful framework, but we have to see them through see this through the eyes of the fed mm. the neutral rate is interest rate where the economy is neither expanding nor contracting okay so what that means is when interest rates are below the neutral rate the economy growth is accelerating and inflation is going up when the new interest rates are above the neutral rate then the economy is slowing down inflation is coming down okay that's how the fed thinks of it okay what is the neutral rate it's 50 basis points in real terms now, and if you listen to people like Larry Summers or Bill Nelson, who was once a very senior Fed official, they're all aghast of what the Fed is doing. Because if you want to arrive at the neutral rate, you have to say, okay, the neutral rate is 50 basis points. The Fed controls the nominal rate, right? So federal funds rate, which is uh, you know around 0.75 to 1% today. Now, how high do you have to get right. the nominal rate to get to a neutral rate? Well, that depends on what you think inflation is, right? So, okay, so last month, inflation was 8%. Now, 8% plus 0 0.50 basis points would get you to a, um, you know, a neutral, rule, neutral rate, nominal neutral rate of 8.5%. Is that, is that, should we use last month's inflation? Or should we use maybe, let's say, five-year, five-year forward inflation, let's say, let's say, 3 4%. So that would get you to a nominal Fed funds rate of 35 you know, 4 4%. Or, so that's kind of the logical ways you would be doing this, right? In, in order to figure out the nominal rate, you just, uh, nominal rate, you have to use inflation plus 50 basis points, which you think is the uh, neutral real rate. Which inflation to use is, is a debatable thing. But what is crazy to use, and which is what the Fed is actually using, is what they think of as the long-term inflation rate. So they're like, you know, my inflation rate, my inflation target is 2%. So longer term inflation is therefore 2% and therefore the neutral rate is 2.5%. Now that's just flat out ridiculous. And people who don't work at the Fed who are used to work at the Fed will tell you that's ridiculous. Um, you're going to have to go much higher than that. And remember, you're looking at this from neutral. So neutral was when the economy is neither expanding or contracting. If you want to slow down inflation, you have to go above neutral to actually constrain growth and in inflation. Now, if the market is pricing in, let's say a Fed funds rate two and a half, three uh, percent, you know that that's that's almost certainly wrong. Um, they probably have to go up to four percent and above um, to, to to get what they need to be, and because the market isn't really understanding that yet, um, that's why there's more pain to come. And in addition, eventually they'll stumble into what QE, QT means, which we've been talking about. So I think that will that will be quite disastrous as well. So I think that we have. Um, some more downside, maybe significant downside to come. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. I talk to a lot of fast growing crypto native funds, crypto banks, exchanges and the like, and they all tell me they have the same two problems. One, their treasury management setup sucks. They've got analysts wasting time and money on manual transactions. Two, they are not happy with their current security setup. They're sharing passwords, they're sending test transactions, and they're worried that their funds might be at risk. Fireblocks is a platform that solves all of that for you. They're a one-stop shop portal, which automatically plugs into exchanges, trading venues, etc. They source deep liquidity and solve everything from day-to-day -day crypto transactions all the way down to complex 
DeFi strategy. And the best thing about Fireblocks is that they offer scalable solutions with industry-leading technology. Doesn't matter if you're a two-person crypto fund or a 2,000-person crypto exchange, these guys have you covered. And the last thing that I'll say about this company is that I have known them for years. They are a high-integrity team. They ship product like no other. I would trust them with my own funds. So click the link at the bottom of this page and tell them that I sent you. Very, very important that you click the link at the bottom here. Otherwise, they're not going to know that I sent you. And then how am I going to get credit? So help a brother out. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Tell them I sent you. You hear very often this narrative, uh, hey, the Fed, they can't control you know, things and they can't solve any supply chain issues, right? They can't solve the war in Ukraine. They can't print wheat, all of this stuff. But I don't think that's how the Fed thinks about it. They know they can't do that stuff. Those are supply side constraints. They're very focused on the demand side. So if they can't touch the supply side, what they're going to try to do, right, is crush the demand side of the economy, right, to bring those ratios more intact so you don't have inflation, right? Um, people, people, you know, and <laughs> point to Volcker, right? They're like, look at what Volcker had to do. Volcker had to jack interest rates up to 18%, uh, yada, yada. We could never do that because of the amount of debt that we have. The flip side of that, though, is because of the amount of debt that we have and the low amount of interest rates, to get the same kind of demand side destruction that Volcker was going for, Powell might have a much easier job, right? He doesn't need to raise interest rates to 18%. Nobody's even talking about that. I don't even, that would be Armageddon. I think the world might literally explode. Uh, all he has to do apparently um, is probably jack interest rates to like three or 4%, right? Before you get that kind of, um, that enormous economic contraction. And then you kind of start to see the wealth effect in reverse, right? Because as much as the wealth effect has right, driven this economic growth, I mean, if you only have to raise interest rates a little bit before you see an enormous contraction in wealth, then couldn't that pull the the economy down further and weirdly make Powell's job easier than people are giving him credit for? Is that wrong? I, I, I don't know. That, no, I, I think that makes sense. I, mm. You know, just, just in line of that train of thought. So the market, so the world today is much more financialized than it was you know, right. 50, 100 years ago. You have a huge equity market, huge uh, bond market. And all that stuff is very sensitive to interest rates. So if you raise a little bit, you will have tremendous declines in value that makes everyone feel poor. Maybe they have less money to send, right? You know, I, I know when people were, you know, I've, I've seen many, many yachts with BTC on it and I've actually seen Porsches <laughs> with BTC on it. So, you know, I would imagine that's going to be less frequent and, you know, that's going to cool down demand a little bit. Um, historically, Volcker went up to, you know, 15 or more percent. Um, Jay Powell definitely doesn't have to go that high. Again, right now we're pricing in say two and a half, three percent. We can going to four, I think, would scare people. Like like you mentioned, that's it's a much lower level than the past, and it's going to have a much bigger impact on the financial asset side um, than with just by going to such a low level. But I think it's important to realize though that this reverse wealth effect, you know, even if you you have to compare to um, no, you can't just compare it to what was happening. Uh, end of last year, you have to compare it to what was, what was like pre-pandemic. And pre compared to pre-pandemic, there's still a whole much, a whole bunch more wealth than, uh, than now than last time, right? So housing prices, everyone's houses have gone up like, you know, 20, 30%, right? That's, that's a lot of mm -hmm. wealth. Stock market still comfortably above, um, you know, pre-pandemic highs. So um, we've, a lot of wealth has vaporized recently in the routes. Still, ton left. Um, I, I'm not sure that enough wealth has been destroyed to to, to slow down the the market. I would actually push against the the the, the idea that you know the, the system can't tolerate high interest rates because of um, level of debt, though. So there's a couple of ways to think about this. First, there's this wealth effect that that's immediate, right? Um, but if you're actually making interest rate payments, you have to realize that inflation rate is much higher than interest rate, right? So you're going to, you're, you're, if you have cash flow, your, your income is increasing faster than interest rates. So you should be able to afford that. Uh, listen, um, you know, if you look at corporate profits, they're record highs, right? So, okay. The federal government, that's super interesting. Actually, this is a, this is a good point to make here. Yeah. Well, first of all, you never have to worry about the federal government paying its bills because yeah. you can always print it. Joseph, you never I, have to worry about it. I gotta be honest. I almost so I feel a little silly. I took you know I you hear you heard that argument a lot like yeah. twelve months ago, two years ago. They the federal government they cannot raise rates because they would be bankrupted by by uh, you know the, the debt servicing costs, and it just didn't occur to me like the the whole system that's been in place 
you know, forever is that they just issue new debt to pay the old debt. Yeah, that's so silly. I mean, listen. So what was I thinking, believing this? (laughs) If the worst thing, I mean, for some whatever reason, they can't issue it at good, like, you know, interest rates that are too at the interest rates that they want to issue at, they can always have the Fed buy it, right? So for a, for a sovereign, this, this debt is never, ever a problem. Mm-hmm. The problem, of course, is that the second round effects of this, uh, which is inflation. So right. that, um, you know, you can be like Argentina, you can be like Brazil, right? You can, um, you could just issue debt, um, you can, you know, pay it by issuing more debt, but then you get high inflation. And that maybe is the world that we're heading to. Yeah. And I guess, you know, what what you might say, right, is that, uh, you know, obviously and not like the, the U.S. government, I find it, I think there'd be almost no chance, right, that they would default nominally. But what they could do, right, and this is the argument, is they're actually doing the only choice that's left available to them, which is to have, it's just to be financial repression and to inflate away the value of the debt slowly over time, right? So you see all these former Fed governors say, hey, we're aghast at what's going on here. I mean, they're so out of whack. But, you know, maybe the folks that are sitting in the Fed, and I think we perennially do, probably don't give enough credit uh, to the Fed, um, you know, but, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of taking the only route that's left available to them because at the end of the day, the decision to spend was not made by the Federal Reserve, right? We, the people, made the decision to, to spend and the Federal Reserve has to find some sort of way to finance that. And maybe this is the only way that it can be financed. I don't know. The, the problem is definitely the choices rise with Congress. Uh, so, right. you know, they, they decide to spend you know, without limit and that has consequences. But, you know, the thing is that the Fed kind of covers for them by, by doing things like Q, QE. So let's say there was no QE. I'm sure interest rates would be much higher. You know, maybe there'd be more concern about fiscal spending. But, you know, you, the, the Fed doesn't, the Fed just kind of subsidizes their, their poor decisions. I just saw Doomberg retweeted something. It was like there was a call. I think this is a New York Times opinions writer uh, on the White House to convene an emergency inflation task force in which the government would buy price dips in global commodities and resell them at a discount to the American public. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine oh my that? God. To, to oh. try to solve inflation, they're going to have the government buy dips. <laughs> so the, the, I remember like, that. The Secretary of Energy had trouble recalling how many millions of barrels of oil the U.S. produced. I'm mm. not sure she'd make a very good commodities trader. I, 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 can't, I can't imagine what she'd be doing. So uh, I think we was, we're going to see a lot of crazy policies come out because a lot yeah. of governments are desperate, right? So you have whispers of a windfall tax on oil and gas, you know, and you have stuff like this happening. So maybe even price control. So I, I think that we're replaying a lot of the mistakes that we made in earlier periods. And that's just human nature. So there, yeah. it's, it's going to be really, really hard to stop what, what it seems to be ultimately a supply shock, a negative supply shock. And, yeah. you know, there's, there's just not a lot of, to do. The Fed can try to make it, try to shrink demand. It's going to cause a recession, but I, I don't see any other way. Yeah. Joseph, I've got um, another question for you, but just, uh, you know, while we're on the subject of narratives or things that I maybe no longer believe, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of worry. This is actually a Matt Levine uh, constant refrain. People are worried about uh, bond market liquidity or whatever. Um, and one, you know, something that you often hear, right, is that with the risk return for bonds being where they are, that there's a steady supply of treasuries coming online because the U.S. still has financing needs, uh, but people aren't going to want to buy these treasuries. But it occurs to me, you know, I, I listened to you and Maroon Macro kind of talk about Basel and, and banking regulations and everything. It seems there are actually probably still some tools in the Fed's toolkit, right, um, for them to pull out. They could just mandate that people buy their securities, right? Uh, you know, all the, like, the, like you could imagine this headline, right? Uh, you know, prices are down, right? Like equities have fallen by X. We should, banks need to put their money even even more safe assets. What's the safest asset there is? Treasury securities, right? And you could demand that not only domestic banks do that, but you could lean on almost like relationships that you have with foreign banks as well, that you want them to actually be safer, buy more treasury securities. And, and then the other thing too is that, I mean, if you look at the example that Japan's central bank has bought or has set, I mean, how, what percentage of the the JGB art market do they own? It's like over 70% or something like that. So I, they, I want not, of it. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they, they want all of it. They want all of it. They want all of it. Yeah, so they could just forgive it or you know transfer it into a hundred year note with no interest. So my my question to you is, you know, there's all these concerns about 
it is the U the the market for U.S. Treasuries is going to be dead. I just don't really see that playing out. I think there's more things that they could do. Do you agree with that? Do you not agree? There are things that they can do. I think you, you, what you mentioned about the regulatory toolkit is a really yeah. good point. So um, the question is when they will do it. So uh, it, for just for just for just to broaden out the context about liquidity in the treasury market. One thing you want to keep in mind that's, is that the treasury market liquidity has not grown in proportion to the size of the treasury market. So if you go back, let's say, 20 years, total amount of marketable treasuries is about $7 trillion. Today, it's about 23. So it's you know more than three times as large as it was 20 years ago. Um, 20 years ago, the amount of ca- the, the death of the treasury market, so the average amount of cash transactions in the treasury market, um, was about $400 billion. Today it's about six hundred billion. So the cash, the, the the market death, the amount of daily cash transactions mm. that the treasury market does each day hasn't really changed, but the universe of treasuries is, is exploded higher. And the way that I think about this is, you have like a you have a concert hall with let's say uh, one big door or a few big doors. The concert hall keeps getting bigger and bigger, but the doors you know stay the same. And so when you're trying to get out. <laughs> you know, this, it, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a mess. It's going to be chaos, and we've already seen that a few times. We saw that in March 2020. We saw that in uh, the flash crash a few years ago. So there's definitely sig- weakness in the treasury market. There are ways to solve that, and like you mentioned, the U.S. government has been mandating a lot of it. You know, a lot of the entities that it controls to buy more treasuries, the banking sector, for example. Um, but the thing is, if you have you know a trillion dollar deficit every year. It really doesn't matter who you mandate to to buy because there's never going to be enough buyers. So um, I suspect that we're going to have to change the rules that allow to allow banks to be able to buy more going forward. But that won't happen until something breaks in the treasury market uh, and then someone can go and fix it and save the day and claim credit. So um, we um, well, worst case scenario is Fed ends up buying everything like the Bank of Japan which might be the end game, actually. If not the banking sector, then, then the Fed. So, you know, just high level. You, if you issue a trillion dollars of debt every year, maybe more as you forgive more student loans and stuff like that, um, that's, that's not sustainable. Someone has to buy that. You know? And if, if, uh, if you can't find anyone to buy it, you're going to have to force the Fed to, to, to buy it all. I have trouble sometimes just working through this in my head. Uh, and obviously, this is kind of, Un- uncharted waters, right? But what would the effect of that be? Like, let's just carry everything tr- through to its logical conclusion, right? Uh, you know, central banks globally uh, are becoming the largest buyers of their own uh, of their own debt. Um, you know, the Bank of Japan is certainly in the lead, but it seems like other countries are catching up. And I, th- I I don't know what percentage of the you know the treasury market the U.S. or the the Fed owns, but I think for tips it's something like it's like twenty four percent of the market or something like that. They own an enorm- enormous amount of tips. Um, so what happens, right, when we <laughs> reach logical conclusion. There are other crises. Central banks continue to have to step in, shore up liquidity. They end up just buying more and more of these of these uh, you know, their respective debt, and they all just own 100%. And they all just say, "Hey, we, we're gonna we're gonna forgive this." That is, so what what happens there? No, the Fed actually owns 40% of the debt between 10 and 20 years. Uh, t- yeah. So, oh, really? You know, yeah, it's an enormous amount. <laughs> they're, they're tried moving towards the VOJ level. Um, <laughs> So that's nuts. I think it. I think it's important to understand mechanically what happens when when the when the central bank is buying the stuff. So you think about it as printing money, and and that's true. But you have to have to think about it one step further and what it's actually buying. Mm. Because let's say the Fed prints a bunch of money, hundred dollars, and goes and buys a hundred dollars in treasuries. Now, in the financial system, a hundred dollars in treasuries, you know, that's kind of you know, like a form of money. You could have a hundred dollar bill that's green and has someone's face on it. It's not that different from a hundred dollars in treasuries, right? It's also print issued by the government. It's like money that pays interest. Uh, the difference being that when the Fed is actually uh, buying the the treasury debt, you know, the, the buying treasuries, then you know, it, it replaces it with something that doesn't pay interest if you're if you're not a bank. And it pushes up the prices of treasury securities, so basically yields lower. So it's not so much that it in- increases the money of in the system, in so much as it changes the composition. 
the, the real problem is just the production, the issuance of Treasury securities, and that has to do with fiscal decisions made by the U.S. government. So if the end game is that the Fed just buys everything, then we're in a world where the Fed, where the U.S. government just kind of has record deficits every year and keeps printing money to buy real goods and services. That is inflationary. So if we were ever in a circumstance where the Fed has to buy everything, then I think we're in a circumstance where um, now th the fiscal situation is, is becoming uh, uns super unsustainable and we just have inflationary bursts like we had the past two years. And there are bigger factors that, that play into this as well. I mean, globally, if you think about it, two things are happening. One, of course, is, seems to be that globalization is coming to some kind of slowdown. You know, we have, we're cutting off Russia and it looks like China is becoming more and more closed. And what that happens, you know, uh, the globalization, efficient uses of resources, lower prices, deglobalization, you could have higher inflation. And, you know, if we have an aging population, that also reduces the labor supply. So, um, to me, you know, if if that's the world that we're heading to, it, it's, it seems like, you know, things are lining up for a more inflationary world. I would have to agree with you. I think the other, um, you know, the less monetary view of uh, inflation in general is a more closed off world is one where you can't borrow other people's labor markets. Right. I mean, that's oh, one that, that's that's really good. That That's very that's a very good way of thinking about it. And we've been borrowing so much labor from the developing world. It's just ridiculous. But, you know, that's actually good for if you're a, a worker in the U.S. Now, now your your prices are going higher and we kind of see that already. Right. So, um, you know, wages continue to increase and maybe it's secular. There's, uh, there's an English guy, Sir James gold or something, Sir James something out. I'll, I'll look it up and link it in the show notes, but you can hear it back in the in the 90s um, or even before kind of making an argument uh, about what would happen in a world of, of global, uh, you know, parity, right? We've seen trade and he, he, he made this exact, he basically predicted the future, right? Which was that in more industrial, more um, developed economies, they would hollow out their industrial bases, they'd farm it over and it would create massive inequality. And he, he kind of is, is arguing this to someone uh, who kind of takes the other side and say, no, this is actually going to increase exports from more developed, uh, you know, economies to, to to less developed ones. And it's like, I'll, I'll link the, uh, I should have, I haven't referred to this in a little while. It's been a while since I've watched it, but I'll, I'll link it in the notes. It's, it's quite a watch. Um, Sounds and, super you know, interesting. And globalization has not benefited everyone equally, frankly. Uh, I think it's clearly benefited uh, maybe more elite circles in different countries uh, disproportionate to, um, you know, certainly the worker base in the U.S. So just we've been talking about a lot of uh, very uh, kind of esoteric stuff here. I want to uh, poke you here for, for some predictions. Let's say over the course of the next, uh, let's say 12 months or something like that. Let's talk about your forecast for um, the bond market. Let's talk about your forecast for equities in general, uh, if you have thoughts, even directionally. Maybe let's start yeah, with equities. Sure. No, I, um, equities, easy. Yeah. it's really easy to say that I think equities are going to go down another 20, 30 percent. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really think that the market is underestimating what it takes to slow down 8 percent inflation. Um, it's I think the Fed is being very careful to prepare the market for what it's doing. It's talking about going to neutral. It's for them. That seems to mean two and a half, three percent. And, you know, if you if you if you want the real scoop, you want to listen to people who are out of the Fed, like, you know, pr uh, former Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, President Dudley, you want to listen to people who got none, who got inflation right, right? It's like Larry Summers. And they're all saying the same thing. We're going to need to have rates higher, maybe 4% or more. That's not priced into the market. And when it does, you're going to have a very big reaction. I think we have about 20, 30% lower to go. Um, rates, same thing. We're going to have QT. QT, I think, is going to be much more impactful than the market thinks it will be. I think one of the ways you can see this is that, so if you listen to the Fed, Governor Waller was out with a speech uh, earlier in the week, and he's like, yeah, QT, it's going to be equivalent to about, you know, two, 225 basis point rate hikes. Um, I, I, I see that, and I think that's comically wrong. It's just comically wrong. So I suspect that the increase in duration, poor liquidity, is going to drive treasury rates much higher and I, I expect the 10-year to be above four percent by the end of this, end of this year um, so that that's all going to combine into a scenario where um, well that's just if you own financial assets it's not going to be good 
you're going to want cash or you be short. And if you want cash, as we talked about earlier in the year, Fed is taking that out of the system as well. <laughs> and that's not going to help. So uh, I, I'm, I continue to be very bearish. You know, we've I've spoken with Jack about this earlier in the year. You know, things have unrolled as I've met, as I suspected. And I continue to hold the view that um, anyone in the market should be very, very careful. But there are bright spots in the market. If you look about, let's say, energy or if you look at um, copper or aluminum, industrial metals. So the way that things are work right now is that the official sector, the government, has a very big role to play in the markets. So in order to see where you know, share markets go, you look at the Fed, right? But that's just not the only actor. You want to look at government policy as well. And Lagarde is telling you in the Eurozone, we're going to double down on green energy. It looks like Biden's going to do the same thing. Doubling down on green is probably the biggest policy mistake ever made, but it means that energy is going to go Fossil fuels are going to go much higher because you're not going to encourage production of it. It means that things that are required for the green transition are also going to go much higher. That's aluminum, that's copper, that's lithium. It's you know it's just mining materials. So um, those have done continue. Those have done really well. You know you have tech and you have the broader share market selling off, but oil keeps going higher. So that's that's actually how I would set myself up to to be negative on you know bonds on broader share market positive on energy and probably uh, other green stuff so that's that's how i look at the markets and i um yeah i think that's how things will play out joseph my last question for you is uh, you know one snippet from your last interview um stood out so you know we're talking about quantitative tightening here and, and one one way that this could all play out right uh is that quantitative tightening takes place the fed continues to hike interest rates so we get to whatever they think the neutral rate is, maybe that's around 4% or whatever it is, um, everything kind of, uh, you know, orderly sort of mar- marches down, right? Uh, the the other scenario, which I think you think is more likely as well, is that something breaks, not something necessarily in the equity markets, probably more something in the credit markets, uh, but which causes the Fed to kind of pause. And that's what happened when we got the Powell pivot in 2018, 2019. I know that scenario is very different. We didn't have 8% inflation. So I'm not saying that's exactly what happened. But the last time the Fed tried to hike to the neutral rate, which back then it thought was 3%, I think uh, they got to about 2% and then stuff started to break. Um, my question to you is, you know, I think I think the numbers, right, for for QT, the initial numbers is um, it's like $15 billion in, in mortgage-backed securities, 37 or something like that in uh, maybe I've got that backwards. It's whatever. It's about, it's about 30. It's 70 and a half and 30. 17 and a half and 30. All right. Between yeah. treasuries and mortgage backed securities. Um, they, they want to jack that up to 95 billion on a monthly basis. No, it, they're going to jack it up to 60 and 30, uh, 60 and 35. So, uh, so 95 maybe. total. Yeah, yeah. 95 total. Um, and I, I think you think that they're not going to get there, right? So is your kind of base case that something breaks before they get to their ultimate target for quantitative tightening? If so, you know, where would that, I know it's difficult to predict this kind of stuff, but where would yeah, that likely so, manifest? So so they're going to hit full speed in three months. So I think they can definitely do that. Uh, when something breaks, uh, again, so I, the way that I look at this is that the, the financial system is always changing and there's a lot of things that depend on things you can't predict. Uh, for example, you know, you could have a panic, sentiment can change and, you know, everyone would sell stocks and buy bonds and things like that. It, it's really hard to predict, but I mean, I, I I think that the Fed will not be able to complete their quantitative tightening program, which they give a three-year timeline. I think we could probably go maybe a year, within a year, but I mm-hmm. think something breaks within a year. And when that happens, the Fed will go in and save the bond market. Uh, we'll have QE restart again. And we're probably going to be in a new paradigm in how monetary policy can conduct it because they're coming to the point where the bond market it's just too big and too illiquid to be managed. It's going to need active management by the Fed. Re- think back to the repo market breaking in September mm-hmm. 2019. Hmm. That repo market broke. Now we have a standing repo facility. Fed is managing the repo market, preventing it from spiking. Look at the FX swap market. Fed is there. FX swaps, you know, spiked higher. Now the Fed is there, willing to lend in the FX swap market. I suspect the end game for monetary policy has to be an higher, more active hand in the bond market as well. So you could have the Fed there, not necessarily having yield curve control, but you can have them saying like, you know, 10-year yield shall not go above 10%, okay, 
shall not go above five percent. And if it ever goes there, we stand ready to buy it at infinite volumes. So you could have something like that happen. That that I think probably was the end game for a market that grows, you know, a trillion dollar a year it's it's just impossible to manage unless you have uh, the official sector involvement so um, we'll, we'll see what happens in the, the next couple of years uh joseph you've already been incredibly generous with your time uh for those of you who don't know i'm sure many of you do uh joseph uh regularly co-hosts on forward guidance with my colleague uh, jack farley some really incredible content there you produce another uh, the whole wealth of, of uh treasure trove of of uh, writings and, and all that kind of stuff. Where's, what's the best way that people can find out more about your work, follow you, do whatever? Well, thanks so much for inviting me, Mikey. It was, it's, I know I enjoy your podcast and thanks. you produce really great content. Um, if you're interested, if you got, guys were listening, if you're interested in following me, I'm on Twitter, FedGuy12. I also have a website, FedGuy.com. And if you're interested in learning more about the mechanics of the financial system, I have a book called Central Banking 101. It's available on Amazon. Uh, very well reviewed. I think it'd be a very good introduction to the financial system. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Joseph. Guys, I highly recommend you check out uh, Joseph's work. As you can tell from this, uh, this, this conversation, he's got an erudite knowledge of the financial system. Also, just a good guy. So highly recommend. Uh, Joseph, thank you so much again for coming on. We'll have to do it again soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. Cheers.